Dear Professor Nicolas Yunukakis, dear students and professors, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the of Hellenism and friends of this amazing Hellenic nationality room of the University of Pittsburgh. Today I'm very happy to be virtually at the Hellenic nationality room under the Intercultural Exchange Program of Center for International Studies of the University of Pittsburgh. Because uh, my memories are still vivid. And thank Nikolaos Yanukakis, my friend, dear friend, and uh, extinguished professor, from uh, this visit to this uh, very clever designed Hellenic room, and of course to the main campus of the University of Pittsburgh. The, the University of Pittsburgh's nationality rooms are a unique, fascinating, and clever feature of the campus. And Hellenic room, located at the Cathedral of Learning, was created exactly to celebrate the Hellenic culture and Greek nationality, which uh, both of them have contributed to the development of Pittsburgh itself, and of course, to the whole United States. This room is dedicated to the history and culture of Greece. The Hellenic group is an impressive tribute to the Greek civilization, featuring beautiful murals, intricate carvings, and of course, authentic Greek furnishing. This speech is focusing to the Hellenic national identity problem and the education of Greeks throughout the difficult Ottoman times for more than 400 years. The education and the preservation of Greek culture, language, and of course the Orthodox tradition that is uh, very close to the culture and the language created the base for the revolution of 1821, which officially is celebrated, we celebrate it, we celebrate, we celebrate on March 25th. The end of the Byzantine Empire was defined by the conquest of Constantinople by Mehmed the Conqueror, but this process had already started with the invasion of Ottomans to many areas of the Byzantine Empire. This very end found the education, art, culture, science, and philosophy at a very high level despite the administration problems that many scholars call this period as the golden period of the late Byzantine era. The educational system of the empire at that time was already formed and based upon the features known from the past. Those norms had been followed almost for 1,000 years, focusing on the cognitive and pedagogical development of children with the moral and spiritual values of Christianity in combination with the treasure of Hellenic education, which was inherited with the great fathers of the church. The consciousness of the Hellenic inheritance, according to Stephen Ransiman, was enhanced by the Latin conquest and the exile in Ike because of their, needs, of, of their need for an identity that could define the cultural and the historical differences from the Westerners. The Greek descendants in the Byzantium area could be proud of speaking and understanding the language of Aristotle, Plato, and others in the original form. The word Hellenism was revived during this period, showing the nature of the late Byzantine self-identity and conscience in a world where ancient Greek learning was increasingly admired, Byzantine people could claim they were Greeks, Hellenes. Their hires in unbroken, the hires in unbroken succession to the poets and philosophers of the ancient Hellenic era. Social identity theory posits that awareness of belonging to a social group or a nation engenders positive feelings and the tendency to behave 
to be to belong of other group members, even if they are unknown to one another personally. Moral values, distinctive traditions, history, culture, and language are features that define this subjective feeling one share with a group of people about a nation, regar regardless of one's citizen citizenship status. The late Byzantine people were proud of the early Byzantine times with the ecumenical councils. They were proud that they speak and understand the original language of the fathers of the church, of the ancient Greek philosophers. They still created similar artworks and theological treatises with the original ecclesiastical values. In this way, the administration of the empire and generally the educational system wanted to produce people really having this specific identity, faithful Orthodox Christians, respectful to the patriarchate of Constantinople, and being proud of their ancient Greek her inheritance. After the 12th century, secondary education intensified and was run mainly by the church, hosting schools at the church buildings. Students were taught reading and writing, basic arithmetic, grammar, spelling, etymology, ancient Greek mythology, political and ecclesiastical history, introduction to rhetoric, and philosophy. For reading, the students used the Psalter and other works of the church. They were getting some basic knowledge of Byzantine music. In this framework of teaching, many courses coming from the classics included, such as coming from the classics included, such as Euclidean geometry, Ptolemian astronomy, Aristotelian physics and geography, botanology, and other important things from the ancient Hellenic world. They used in their learning copies from famous ancient writers such as Theophrastus, Hieron, Hippocrates, Euclides, and many others. The connection between Christianity and Hellenism in education continued for almost 400 years until the fall of Constantinople Eve and this framework continues somehow and after this year. Of all Mehmed's contributions, his most notable and celebrated was his conquest of Constantinople in 1453. The siege was relatively brief by historic standards, lasting a grand total of 53 days. Mehmed II went in with a strong army and guns blazing, or cannons that is, the most powerful ones the world had ever seen until that point. Once they had breached the infamous 12-meter-tall Theodosian walls, the fight for Constantinople was over quickly. The city was captured, officially bringing the Roman Empire to an end. One would assume the Sultan's next move might be to forcefully plunder the city, but Mehmet wasn't just any leader. While he did want to restore the Christian capital as a Muslim one, he additionally wanted it to be the political, economic, and social center of the area it had formerly dominated. He aimed to repopulate the city with all conquered peoples of the empire, whose intermingling would prove a model for a powerful and integrated empire. Pretty forward thinking for the period. Furthermore, under Ottoman rule, all major religious groups were allowed to establish their own self-governing communities, called millets, each retaining its own religious laws, traditions, and language under the general protection of the Sultan. So, a total utopia, where all are welcome and arts, culture, and social sciences are celebrated. The administration structure, which was imposed in the former Byzantine Empire by Mehmed the Conqueror, was already prepared after the invasion to the Greek-speaking lands before 1453. There was no real distinction between military and civil administration. All provincial governors were military commanders respons responsible to the Sultan, and the principal functions of the administration in the conquered territories were to maintain a military establishment and stability collecting taxes. Non-Muslims were forbidden by law to ride a horse and to carry arms. They were rayas, similar to cattle for Muslims. The life of the subject people under the Ottoman system 
varied from area to area in the empire and depended on the personal desires of the governors. There were different types of taxation among the conquered in the Ottoman Empire. The tribute of children required that one male child in five of, in five of every Christian family between the ages of 10 and 20 should be taken away to be enrolled in the corps of Janissaries. The main tax on non-Muslims was the Haraz, or capitation tax. In return for taxation, non-Muslims enjoyed relative freedom to manage their own lives, to have their own religious gatherings, and to provide their own education. Each such religious community was regarded by Ottoman Turks as an autonomous nation, yet under its religious leaders. In the case of all Orthodox Christians, and not only Greeks, the leader was the Patriarch of Constantinople. Muslim traditions require that the Christians being people of the Bible should be treated with a particular tolerance. There were also political and financial motives for such tolerance in the case of the Greeks. By favoring the Orthodox Christians, Ottomans would expect to increase the gap between the rival churches and to destroy possible allies in Christendom. Consequently, the church's position became extremely powerful and thus the church became the main vessel for preserving the culture, education, and traditions of Hellenism. That's why Mehmed the Conqueror chose Genadius Scholarius as the Patriarch of Constantinople and the leader of Orthodox Christians and thank Scholarius' finest achievement that he worked out with conquering Sultan a constitution for Orthodox in the Ottoman Empire, which at the end saved the national identity of Greeks and Hellenism. Also, the relative freedom that the Sultan gave to the Patriarchate, the new situation for the Greeks in Ottoman Empire was very difficult. One of the biggest challenges for Patriarch Genadius was with education of the Greek millet. Many of the best professors and scholars had already migrated to the greater security of Italy or other Western countries. Genadius founded the Patriarch School of Constantinople the next year, 1454.
Its first director, Matthäus Kamariotis, close friend to Patriarch Gennadius, and the teacher of philosophy, strived to organize the school, preserving the Greek education in this difficult time without manuscripts, which many of them had destroyed. He taught philosophy, rhetorics, and grammar. The difficulties of that time appeared in a comment of Martin Crucius or Kraus, a professor of Greek at Tübingen in 1555, about the situation and lack of the schools. He wrote, he wrote, they have no public academies or professors except for the most trivial schools in which the boys are taught to read the horologion, the octoichon, the psalter, and other books which are used in the liturgy. This was the same with the Greek people of the empire. The Byzantine practice for the churches to support education was fitted within the new difficult framework. Parishes and local communities supported the education of the children, keeping alive the Greek language and the historical traditions of the nation. This could be seen within the evolution of typography for Greek language. Among the 40,000 incunabula editions that were released in the West during the 15th century, only 70 are Greek and they were mostly printed by the printing, the printing presses in Italy. The other book, the other incunabulum, was written by Constantine Laskaris, who was a Greek scholar and teacher of the 15th century. He was born in the city of Constantinople and was a prominent figure in the intellectual renaissance of that period. Among his other books, Epitome of the Eight Parts of the Speech, Epitome ton Octomeron to Logu, was a work of grammar and rhetoric that was published in 1520 after his death. The work was an abridged version of the Eight Parts of Speech, and it was intended to provide a comprehensive overview of the structure of language for the benefit of students. As such, it was a pioneering work of pedagogical grammar. Epitome also included several other features, such as diagrams and examples of usage, and it was considered to be one of the most important works of its kind. It was a major influence on later works of grammar and rhetoric, and it, and it was instrument, instrumental in the development of modern pedagogical grammar. Be noticed that the production cost at that time of printed books was enormous. For example, the production of an edition of John of St. John Chrysostom in eight volumes of the year 1612 cost, costed, amounted, costed to an enormous amount of 8,000 pounds, equivalent to 2.5 million current dollars, while the sale price for each, for each one of the 1,000 sets was fixed to nine pounds, equivalent to 2.5 thousand today's dollars. The Greek books had the potential to stir religious controversy and religious propaganda, preserving the pride of Hellenic heritage. During the Ottoman period, some of the liturgical religious books were also used as textbooks. Very important moment for the Greek education during the Ottoman period was the Holy Synod of 1593, which was convened by Patriarch Jeremy II the, with the name Tranos. One of its decisions was that the Metropolitans 
that time were required to establish Greek schools in their metropolises, saying the rule, each bishop has to find and fund appropriate ways for teaching holy texts according to the financial ability of this diocese and to financially support those who want to teach and to learn. This decision enabled these Greeks, enables the, enabled the, the Greeks to open many schools in, beside the great school of the nation in Constantinople. In the late 16th century, seven schools were opened in main cities, such as Athens, Livadia, Chios, Smyrna, Smyrna, Kidonias, Patmos, and Ioannina. And then in the beginning of 17th century, 40 more schools were opened across Greece and Asia Minor. At the beginning of the 17th century, there had been attempts to introduce Greek typography in the center of the Orthodox world, Constantinople. To counter the propaganda of the Catholic Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation, Patriarch Cyril Lucaris, 1572-1638, until 1638, with the support of his best friend and the late Patriarch of Alexandria, Metrophanes Critopoulos, a very educated monk at that time, founded, in collaboration with the educated monk Nicodemus Metaxas, 1585-1646, a printing house in Constantinople, which operated for only a couple of years between 1627 and 1688, before it was closed by the Turk authorities. Lucaris had the experience of managing a printing press in Poland, printing Greek Orthodox books, and wished to maintain a printing press at the service of his Orthodox flock in Constantinople, it was to educate and rejuvenate the Orthodox flock by printing and disseminating Byzantine theological texts. Patriarch Cyril Lucaris appointed Theophilus Corydaleus as a director as a director of the Great School of the Nation. Theophilus, with studies in medicine, philosophy, and uh, other sciences at that time. At the University of Padua, brought a new spirit to the education and, att and attracted very good teachers from Western Europe and introduced physics as a new syllabus for the curriculum of the school. Theophilus was a student of Galileo Galilei, who was the chair of the Department of Mathematics until 1610 in, uh, at, the, at the University of Padua. A hundred years would pass before Greek typography and printing uh, and press would be reactivated again in, again in Constantinople by the hieromart patriarch Gregory V. He was born in Dimitsana and studied in Athens, Smyrna, and Patmos. He was elected patriarch of Constantinople in 1797, resigned in 1798, and re-elected two more times in 1806 after, and after his resignation again and, um, in, uh, in the year say, 1818. He was hanged by Ottomans directly after the Paschal liturgy on April 20, uh, 22nd, 1821, taken brutally out of the Patriarchal Cathedral and his corpse being left for two days on the main gate of the Patriarchate headquarters, headquarters that uh, is uh, still closed because of that, uh, of that kill. He, uh, he is of his kill. He, he, is, he organized again the Greek educational system, founding very good teachers. <clears throat> One of them, Dimitrios Katargis or Fotiadis, was born in Constantinople and educated there. He was a great proponent of the Greek language. He was uh, the first to use the Greek word ethnos for describing a collective of, clear, of clearly defined cultural and linguistic heritage 
as a nation. The connection between national awakening and language was elaborated by him. Another one was Evgenius Vulgaris, and he was a cleric, mathematician, astronomer, physicist, and philosopher with uh, studies at the University of Padua again. He was uh, the director of the Athonite Academy, bringing ideas of enlightenment. Another one, Michael Perdicaris, who was from Kozani, and he was uh, a prominent physician of his era. He thought uh, of di at different schools of the time in the area of Kozani and wrote very important books, very popular that time. The most important one had the title Ermilos or Dimokrithiraklitos. It was a poetic novel with 20 odes. One of the most prominent figures in the beginning of 18th century, of course, was Cosmas of Etolia. St. Cosmas of Etolia is considered one of the great missionaries of the Orthodox Church. Much like St. Paul, he traveled a great distance to proclaim the gospel. He built schools and reinvigorated the Orthodox faithful of Greece during the time of the Ottoman occupation. Costa, as he was first named, was born in 1714 in the village of Megadendron in the mountainous regions of Etolia. His parents were originally from Ipiros and worked as weavers. At age 20, Costa learned and then taught Greek grammar under the guidance of Archdeacon Ananias. He also studied theology and medicine. The educational system was in crisis, with most intellectuals fleeing to the West. The common folk lived in poverty and were considered inferior subjects by the Ottomans. They lost all hope for a better future. With his spiritual father's approval, Cosmas traveled to Constantinople and received encouragement from many bishops and priests along the way. Finally, Patriarch Seraphim II granted Cosmas a permit to preach. His first apostolic journey began in the villages around Constantinople. As the crowds gathered at each place, he would stand on a low pulpit that rested in front of a large wooden cross and begin preaching. Brethren, I am a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified. Not that I am worthy to be a servant of Christ, but Christ condescended to have me because of his compassion. Not only am I not worthy to teach you, but not even worthy to kiss your feet, for each of you is worth more than the entire world. loved and greatly identified with the people among whom he moved and worked, speaking their language and using illustrations from their daily life to proclaim the gospel. Cosmas traveled next to Thessaloniki, then through Macedonia, Thessaly, and Etolia, finally crossing over to the island of Kefalonia, sharing his urgent but simple call to repentance at each stop, and also visited the islands of Skiathos and Skopelos before going into Epiros and southern and central Albania. The crowds that gathered to meet him were so large, he had to bring along 40 to 50 priests just to assist with confessions. He was even able to secure the donation of 4,000 baptismal basins to the churches throughout the land. His third and final journey was spent primarily on some of the Ionian islands, the Kiklades, and even some of the Dodecanisa, before he returned to the mainland. He traveled through Thessaly to Etolia and visited Vrahori, Mesolongi, and Nafpaktos, speaking often about his great love for God and neighbor. Arta, Preveza, and the Oanina were his final stops before he headed further into what is now Albania. Cosmas understood how important it was to create an educational foundation that could sustain orthodoxy for generations. Brethren, learn as much as you can. Educate your children to learn Greek, because our church uses Greek. And if you don't learn Greek, you can't understand what our church confesses. It is better for you to have a Greek school in your village rather than fountains and rivers. 
For when your child becomes educated, he is then a human being. Even today, the people of Greece have great love for Saint Cosmas. He devoted himself completely to his mission and contributed greatly to the revival of Orthodoxy in Greece. Cosmas, as we saw in the video, was called Apostle of the Nation and he was a great missionary and teacher enlightening our nation. He established Greek schools everywhere in Western Greece using the parents, urging the parents to send their children for them to learn Greek language and Greek letters. He used to say to the parents during the gatherings they organized in, they organized in the places he visited, if you don't persuade your kids to study, learn and love Greek letters, how do they suppose to understand the teaching of the church? Because services in the church are in Greek. Whatever faithful open a school, a prison closed, a church or a monastery open. He also suggested the priests serve the services and liturgies in the ancient language, saying the prayers slowly, understandably, and loudly, listening to by all, listening, listening to by all the congregation. He established almost 200 schools in 16 years of his public activity. He is one of the main pillars of the late strengthening of Greek nationality identity, which drove the nation to the revolution of, of 1821. The official local schools were established around the Ottoman Empire, budgeted by the little income of, of parishes and communities Although sometimes local Turkish rulers imposed by force the closure of the school in their area. Although that, uh, that events, they have uh, all the school, uh, schools have talented students eager for learning and students from rich families which wanted their kids to acquire further education. Beside those schools in thousands of villages, of villages with Greek populations, the traditional ed education system of Byzantine Empire was there, continues to offer basic education to the young people. Teachers were mainly priests, deacons, or chanders, and they organized the lessons at the church building. They taught reading and writing to the kids who loved studying or wanted to become priests. They used simple books from everyday service, practice, and of course, they learned the ancient Greek. Because attendance to these to, to this, uh, church schools were not required, and the education system was not consistent and unique, the, uh, and unique, the quality of education depended entirely on the ability and the will of clergy and lady teachers. For this reason, there were no clear education results There were no clear educational results, and thus, in the end of the 17th century, according to St. Cosmas the Italian, illiteracy to the Greek people was common. This does not, that does not mean that all these efforts were in vain, and learning of Greek letters was without any result. Hidden results produced with strengthening the national identity and self-determination as a discrete nation with deep and rich quality roots in the history, waiting for the glorious days for the pa of the past to come again in the future. So the nation was ready for the revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. The later could be proven somehow studying the evolution of the new martyrdoms in numbers after the 15th century and until the end of the 19th century. If you see the, the, the diagram, we can see, if you, in the diagram, we can see that during, that during the Ottoman period of 400 years, 135 martyrs gave their, life, uh, their lives and 75% of them lived between, 
seventeen and eighteen seventeen hundred and eighteen fifty, with a peak during the Greek Revolution of eighteen twenty one. This fact would tell us that the church and the education which was provided to the nation kept this national identity vivid and secured during the Dark Ages, ready for explosion and regenerating the nation with the Great Revolution of 1821. In conclusion, ecumenical patriarchate with its, with its initiative in education for over 800 years kept the identity of Greek Orthodox through the centuries alive. Today, we are proud to be part of this God-created institution, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, under the spiritual and pastoral leadership of His All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew. We are proud to be children and to work in the vine of the Greek-American Archdiocese of America under the spiritual and pastoral guidance of His Eminence Archbishop Elifidophoros of America. And, of course, with the Greek Education Department, that uh, I, where I'm the vice, the, the associate director. His eminence inspires us to ensure the Greek education in the States, in the United States of America, as you, as this nationality, nas national room, Greek national room, sharing the values of Hellenism in language and tradition with fellow Americans and being proud of this Greek Orthodox identity of our nation. Thank you for your attention.